today we will study the book of Numbers. Most Christians who have been Christians for a while will say, yes, I've read through the book of Numbers. But if you ask them, what can you tell me or what do you remember about the book of Numbers, most of them have very little to tell you. Now, actually, this book is a little difficult to read and I'll explain why. But there's probably one verse you've heard from the book of Numbers and uh, probably we didn't know it was from the book of Numbers. And that is the benediction that is very commonly given in churches at the end of a service. The pastor will stand up and say, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and give you grace. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. So for many, we've heard that all along, but never knew that was from Numbers. That was given by God to Aaron to bless the people before they went on their journey after Sinai. Now, actually, the gospel is in this benediction. The Lord give you grace. That's the beauty of our faith. Grace. The grace of God in Jesus Christ. Grace is giving you something you don't deserve. Graciously given to us, Jesus Christ. And when we have Christ, we have peace. For most religions, it's God did not give them grace. God gave them some laws some rules to fulfill and hopefully they will try to fulfill it in their lifetime and at the end of it all never be sure and they never have peace they neither have grace nor peace so this benediction is a beautiful actually encapsulation summary of the gospel the good news now why is the book called numbers because there are a lot of numbers in the beginning of the book in the end, the numbers come from a census that was taken just as the Israelites were about to leave Mount Sinai to the Promised Land. And then the next census taken at the end of the book of Numbers was taken almost 40 years later. We don't realize there was a gap. And that was just before they actually entered the promised land. Now, when you see these numbers in the census, how many people, males over 20 years old, that's called a military census. It's very common in those days, they don't count women and children because they don't really matter. In most census in those days took the able-bodied men, 20 years old and above, and that is called a military census. So the military census taken in the beginning in the end, you'll see the numbers are almost the same. A slight drop from 600 over 1,000 here. You, after 40 years, instead of being much more, they were just about 2,000 less than the original census. Right? So this is, in fact, every tribe was more or less the same, if you have time to compare. But what does it tell us? Normally, the blessings of God in the Old Testament are counted in terms of, measured in terms of fruitfulness. Your cattle will have more, uh, your sheep will be more, your fruits will be more, your children will be more. So the fact they did not go more and neither less or so little difference probably said that God was, did not bless them in these 40 years. Okay, so I hope that gives you an idea of why the book is called Numbers. And these two senses, remember there's a 40-year gap. Now, if you remember reading Leviticus, quite a long book too, it only covered a period of roughly a month when the children of Israel were camped at Sinai and receiving the law from Moses, who got it from God. You know, the word was, and God spake to Moses. And God, the Lord, spake to Moses. You know, that was repeated, repeated in Leviticus. Leviticus covers just a period of one month. 
Numbers, on the other hand, covers a period of 40 years. So sometimes we don't grasp this. Okay? And furthermore, if you take your Bible now and you look from Exodus 19, that means the second half of Exodus, the first half is about how they got out of Egypt, you know, a lot of action, action, travel, travel, travel. Then they reach Exodus 19, they reach Sinai, Mount Sinai. The whole of Exodus 19, right through Leviticus, right through Numbers chapter 10, okay? So you see half the book of Exodus, the whole book of Leviticus, and the beginning part of the book of Numbers actually is all one continuation at Sinai. They were in the same place. The period was not long between Exodus 19 and Numbers chapter 10. I hope you get it now, okay? But from Numbers 10 onwards to the end of Numbers, it's almost 40 years. <laughs> Okay, so Exodus 19 onwards to Numbers 10, a lot of chapters. It's just a few months. But Numbers 10 to Numbers, the end Numbers say, end of Numbers, is 40 years. So I hope you get the picture there. Okay, so if you see, they were actually in the same place in Exodus 19, same place in Leviticus, same place in the early part of Numbers listening to and God said to Moses and God said to Moses do this do this and God said to Moses tell the people to do this do this nothing more than laws laws rules you say why so many laws and rules wow it's cumbersome it's so much about laws and rules so little about people why well it's because of God's presence you see, God was going to be in the midst of his people. It began at Sinai. They saw the Lord come down in a cloud. The whole of Mount Sinai caught fire as if the mountain was burning. And they heard God's voice booming out of the heavens. Oh, God is that near on top of Mount Sinai. And then later, after that, in Leviticus, God tells them, or rather in the end of Exodus, God tells them, build a tabernacle. Wow. And a tabernacle was built right where they stayed. In that, in their real estate, right in the midst of them, a tabernacle was built. And God's presence came down in a cloud. Imagine from heaven, this massive cloud comes down and stays on top of the tent of the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. Whoa! God's presence right there in that eyesight. At night, that pillar of cloud became a pillar of fire. Imagine a like fire coming down, never burning the tent, providing light for three million people. Wow! God's presence was with them. The problem with that is that when God's presence is with you, day in, day out, 40 years, what happens? You get presumptuous. We say familiarity breeds contempt. You get used to something. You live with, let's say your father is the king. You live with him all your life. You probably don't look at him as a king. He's just an ordinary guy. Actually, he's a king, right? So, the same way, God is there, but because he's so close to them, there is a tendency to be presumptuous, to take God carelessly, frivolously, not to reverence God. You see, this is the balance we need. As our faith tells us, we have a, what do we have? A relationship with God. I told you Christianity, you have to describe it in one word. What is the result of Christianity? I always say relationship with God. He's my God. I am His child. 
He lives in me. He never leaves me. Wow, that is that relationship. But on the other hand, that close relationship can result, instead of having a wonderful relationship with God, can result in pride and presumption in me to take God like nothing. Okay? So I hope you understand why all these rules were given to them. It's because God's presence was so close to them that they would, and 40 years they had that presence, until every night they see the light, it's like, oh, just light. Just light. Day they see the cloud, just cloud. Instead of, that's God. The presence of God. Okay? So I hope you understand why so much of from half of Exodus, the whole of Leviticus, and one third of Numbers is just legislation and laws to tell them, don't be presumptuous. Okay? Now, if you look at the laws, you can roughly divide them into three categories of laws. Or, shall we say, the laws we can say are, number one, they are costly. Wow! Sacrifices all the time, morning, evening, a cow, a, a bull is slaughtered, endless sacrifices, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Every time you go to the tabernacle, to the altar, there's some animal being slaughtered. That costs money, lots of money. Imagine you're in the wilderness, you have cattle which you brought out of Egypt, but hey, each person may have a couple of cattle. You slaughter it and you offer it. So it tells us that the laws that are enacted, given to them, were costly laws. What is this? What's the purpose? Also, they had to support the priests and one whole tribe, the Levites. So basically, it cost them to approach this God. It's to remind us that while we are saved so freely through Jesus Christ by trusting in Him, don't forget Christ had to pay, pay a great price for our salvation. He had to live 30 years, 33 years on this earth, live a perfectly sinless life. Imagine the Son of God had to leave heaven for 33 years for us, and then die on the cross for us. So while our salvation is free, a gift, don't forget the costliness of it. So second thing about the laws is cleanliness. There are a lot of laws about how you clean this, you touch a dead body, this is what you do. If you have a menstrual period, this is how you do. They were called ritual cleanness, okay, to make yourself fit to approach God. A lot of it was ritualistic clean. Not all of it is hygiene. In fact, of the laws, you know, we say, oh, you can eat this, you can't eat this. Is it because it's nutrition? I don't think so. If there is, it's a side reason. It's not the main reason. The main reason is to tell us we are to approach God clean. Though I may be saved, Yet, as I come to God, if I have any sin in my life, yet uncleaned by the blood of Jesus, I have to confess that sin and ask the blood of Jesus to cleanse me that I can now come into fellowship with God. God is my God. Just like my father and I, we kept that relationship between my earthly father and me can never be broken. Whatever I do, I change my name, I change my face, I change everything. He's still my father. That cannot be changed. When we receive Jesus, God is our God. But my fellowship with my earthly father depends on my behavior. If I don't do right, my father would ignore me. Dad, Dad, can I have this? He'll look at me like, what are you asking for? Fellowship is broken, not relationship. Okay? So, 
cleanliness is a lot of the laws are so ritualistic in cleansing okay the food laws you know a lot of people think the food laws are for hygiene and health no the bible is not primarily a medical book or nutritional book the laws of food are to tell the jews to be very careful to choose what is acceptable to god and what is not so every time the jew look israelite look at his food is decide can or cannot will god be pleased or not pleased with it if i eat this it's like us as christians should i do this or should i not do this Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference, but I have to discern and say, no, no, I don't think it would please my God if I did that. The third thing, costly, cleanliness, and then costliness, cleanliness, and carefulness. You will see in the laws that a lot of it was, as they approached God, they had to be very careful how they approach not just clean but careful example the tabernacle was right in the midst of the two million two to three million people yet they could see the tabernacle but nobody could touch it the screen nobody can go and touch it around the tabernacle the levites were posted on the front of the entrance of the tabernacle, Moses and Aaron were there. They lived there. The tents were then built away from the tabernacle. Nobody could touch that fence at the, at the threat of death. Then, if you look from a helicopter and you flew over the Israelites in the wilderness, you will see the tents, the tabernacle in the middle, and all the tents very properly situated around the tabernacle. There were 12 tribes, three tribes on the one side, three tribes on the other side, three tribes on the other side, three tribes on the other side, carefully positioned. Interesting. We always see the tents built as if they were made of canvas, white in color, likely the tents of these people were black because generally tents were made with the hair of black goats because it was very good to keep warm in winter, keep the sun out and even the rain. Amazing. The black hair woven becomes very good tent material. So if you look down from the helicopter, you see this white fence in the middle and then all black tents in order around it, very orderly. And when every time the cloud lifted up and moved on so the people of the trumpet was blown, they had to move, the, leave, the priests were the only ones who were allowed to go in and touch the tabernacle furniture, utensils. They were the only ones who could touch it. And then they were the only ones who could wrap it. And then the Levites, each one knowing his role, would pick up what was there and carry it on. Very careful. And nobody could come within 1,000 cubits. 1,000 cubits is almost half a kilometer <clears throat> from the tabernacle as it moved. And they moved in perfect order. <laughs> Judah starts going off first because Judah is the first tribe in the procession. Judah means praise. Uh, so praise as they move out and this tabernacle was in the middle and all of them knew their rightful position, carefulness. So as Christians today, one of our biggest sins, I believe, is the sin of carelessness. Modern language, casualness. Anything will do. It's just, he's gone. Let's worship God anyway. Dress any way we like. Do what we like and worship God. I am afraid these are sins we do not realize. We always think of sins as something you do that's very glaring, that people say, shouldn't do that. You know? 
Maybe you take drugs, you get drunk, or you commit adultery, or even some like homosexuals. Wow, pastor, they are like that. Do you know, I think our commonest sins are not sins of commission. Doing something that everybody can see, you committed that sin. I think most of our Christian sins are sins of presumption. Just lack of reverence. I hope you understand these laws were meant to prevent carelessness coming to God, presumption in coming to God. I always believe since the commission, we often don't commit because people can censure us. Don't do that. Since of omission, we do a lot because nobody censures you. You're supposed to make disciples. You don't. Nobody's going to school you for that. You're supposed to evangelize. You don't. Nobody's going to say anything. You're supposed to read your Bible, you don't read. Nobody knows. And then the sin of casualness. It's become so normal today. Everything is so casual. But not, if you see the laws, you understand God. It's a God of order and carefulness. Okay, so I hope this gives you a better understanding of the character of God. If your father is a very careful person, then you better behave in a way that pleases him. And so is our God. He's clean, he's careful, okay, and I hope this helps us. That's why these laws are repeated over and over again to help us sink into our head the sins that we commit without knowing. All right, now let's see what other lessons they learn in these 40 years in the wilderness. What were they doing all the time? 40 years is a long time. It's their whole adult, adult lifespan. What were they doing? Okay. You know what they were doing? Nothing. They didn't have to work. Manna dropped from heaven. The Bible says, in the sweat of our brow, we shall eat bread. But they didn't have to sweat. It dropped. Outside their tent, they picked up this like dew. It became like little flakes. And they collected the flakes. Very easy. No effort right around the house. And then that became their total nutrition. They could bake it, they could fry it, they could do whatever they wanted in it. And it was all the nutrition. So they never had to do a day's work. Their clothes never wore out. They never had to stitch their clothes, sew their clothes. The same thing they had was good forever. The shoes never wore out. Amazing. So what were they doing all the time for 40 years? Only one thing. Worship. That's it. Nothing else to do. There was no entertainment. The only thing they could see, they see the tent, they see this massive cloud of fire, they see Moses going in, they hear God talking, they see people carrying sheep. That was that's the entertainment every day. All they saw was the tent, the center of attraction, all the activity was around the tent, and it was just 24-7 worship. What's the lesson we have to learn from this? Worship is not what you do on Sunday for two hours. Oh, let's go for our worship service after we can do whatever we like. No, 1 Corinthians, I'm talking about New Testament. 1 Corinthians 10 31 says, Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything we do, God centered for God's glory. Whatever we do. So they were taught this lesson that the most important thing in life is to be God centered. Number two. For 40 years, they were in the wilderness. Nobody around. Literally nobody around. Maybe the closest would be 30, 40 kilometers away, some town, they never got near them. They were separated from the world. Someone said this very, very nice statement. The Israelites took 40 years to leave Egypt to go to Sinai. But then they needed 40, sorry, it took 40 days to leave Egypt and go to Sinai. Days, huh? But they needed 40 years from Sinai to get rid of Egypt from their lives. They could leave Egypt, but Egypt did not leave them. What does that mean? The thinking of Egypt, 
They had been there three, four hundred years. They fought like the Egyptians. Pagan gods, immorality, all the idols here, idols there. So God had to separate them to get Egypt out of them. Interestingly enough, once they cross into the Promised Land, we never see them look back on Egypt. It was forgotten. It's not even in the history after that. But up to this point, all the time they look back. Oh, we miss the fish, we miss the leeks, we miss the onions of Egypt. Okay? Let's go back to Egypt. Separation from the world. Is this Old Testament? Is this for the Israelites? What does Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 teach us? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, that ye be not conformed to the world, but that ye be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. We're supposed to separate from the world too. But I don't see Christians doing that. Yeah, maybe for two hours on Sunday they go. The rest of the time, you can't tell a Christian by his behavior, by his talk, by his likes and dislikes from a non-Christian. Almost impossible. Okay, number three. What level lesson? All their needs were provided by one God. You see, but what's new? What's new? Don't forget they came from Egypt. And all their needs in Egypt were provided by different gods. There was the God of the field. There was the God of uh, rain. There was the God of crops. There was the God of the cattle. Every time they wanted something, there was a, a God for it. And now, everything is provided by God. Water, food, protection, health, their clothes, everything is provided by one God. Whoa! You say, oh, they needed to learn that, you know, because they were in Egypt and there are so many idols there. You know, Christians need to learn that. Have you thought about it? We say, yeah, God will get me to heaven. I trust God will get me to heaven. But, you know, happiness, I've got to look back for that myself. God give happiness? I, I, I think food will give me happiness. I think holidays will give me happiness. I think the recreation, you know, truly the one that makes you really have joy and peace is God. Honestly, after I became a believer, whatever food you give me, it tastes really good. Whatever holiday I go with my family or whatever, my, my wife, it's great. Why? <laughs> because that one God of mine, makes everything good. One God touches every part of my life, my social, my emotional, my mental, my spiritual, one God. I don't need to look for this, God takes care of my spiritual things. No, 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 one God. Another lesson, manna was provided for one day only, except on the sixth day, they had to collect two days for the Sabbath. What's this lesson? We need to depend daily on God. You say, oh yeah, now uh, Not really, right? I've got a job, I get my monthly salary from there, you know, but you could lose your job tomorrow, you know, if God doesn't protect it. Like now we have this virus and everybody, a lot of people lost their jobs. You see, my point is this. In the New Testament, Jesus taught them to pray this prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Wow! <laughs> Daily bread. I like that. Not by the month or by my life. No, 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 no. Every day you need God. Your health, you need God every day. You can't say, I'm a healthy guy, I'm a strong guy, I don't get sick. No, 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 no. One virus and you're down. Okay? Emotionally, you can't say, I'm a happy family. You know, an event can happen, turn your whole life around. You need daily dependence on God. Give us this day our daily bread. And number five, interestingly enough, many people never think about this. Can you imagine two to three million people in the middle of nowhere? You think people will recognize it? I'm sure. I'm sure there were all the tribes around will be talking about them. Hey, do you know there's this 
massive multitude of people out there, camped there. Do you know what? They have to have a building and there's a fire all night. Every night. Wow. And every day there's a pillar and when they walk, this pillar goes with them. You know what? People are talking about that. You know what? They don't have a lot of gods. They just have one God. One temple, they're not a temple to this, a temple to that. There are so many temples. No, no, no. One God, one tabernacle. They were actually demonstrating without realizing to others around who the true and living God is. Do you know that's our role as Christians every day? That people look at our lives and say, wow, that guy, amazing. His God seems to prove Give him joy, give him peace, give him calmness, give him patience. Wow! You know, people don't see God in a trance, in a dream. People don't read the Bible. You have to shine. We are ambassadors for Christ. Alright, so I hope these are the 40 years, they were learning these lessons, maybe not <laughs> consciously, but God was teaching them. And I think these are lessons we need to learn. Now, the irony of it all is, out of the two to three million, only two of them entered the promised land. Two to three million came out of Egypt, two entered the promised land. The others wandered 40 years, neither in Egypt, where they had some pleasures, like the fish, the leeks, the beautiful food of Egypt, but neither in the Promised Land. They were in limbo, wandering. Actually, you thought they walked a lot. No, let me tell you, okay? They actually were in about 40 different places, that's all. 40 years, 40 places, roughly. Basically, they stayed one year in one place. Hardly doing anything, just worship all day, learning the five lessons I just mentioned. Why? Because God was allowing them, the rebellious generation, He said to them, you will not enter the promised land. So God was letting literally them die one by one first. Literally killing time, <laughs> not killing time, time was killing them. So that by the time they moved into the promised land, not one of them would go in except for Joshua and Caleb, two people. What's the lesson we learned? For us as Christians, we got saved because we trusted in Jesus. But how many of us enter the promised land? The promised land is not heaven. Huh? Please don't confuse it. The promised land is not heaven. Let me repeat that. How can it be heaven? When they entered into the promised land after this in the next book, of Joshua, they had to take possession of the land. They had often to fight. That cannot be heaven. <laughs> but when they entered the promised land, they realized we have arrived home. We are now in the place God wants us to be. That's like being in the will of God. And then as a it speaks, the promised land speaks of the victorious Christian life. Wow! What is the victorious Christian life? You know in the will of God and you conquer sin, conquer sin, conquer sin. Right? And then your life gets better and better. As the Israelites conquered this town, this city, this tribe, their life became better. But they were already in the place God wanted them to be. I ask you as a Christian, are you in limbo 40 years? Neither enjoying the pleasures you used to, all the sins you used to, and neither enjoying the rest, the peace, and the victories over sin, and the closeness to God, the peace and joy that passes all understanding. Are you there? My guess, I hope it's better than two out of two million Christians will find this rest in God's promised land here.
on earth. We continue on our study of the book of Numbers by trying to pick up some useful lessons as we look down the chapters. In chapter 10, we find that as Moses was about to depart from Sinai, he pleaded with his father-in-law, Hobab, to please join us on our journey. And he said, you will be eyes to us. Hobab had lived all his life in this wilderness. And Moses knew that he knew this wilderness inside out. So really, he needed his help as they navigated their way around. Now, what lesson can we learn from this? The lesson is that we can get help from non-believers. See, a lot of us as Christian leaders, we often are very fearful to learn from non-Christian sources. So often we are so narrow in our thinking, so backward in new things we don't know, simply because we are afraid to learn from non-Christians. Now, I've always believed in this principle that when you learn to eat a fish, the first thing you must do is to learn how to spit out the bones. Okay? Otherwise, you can't eat good fish. So, that's what I mean. When we learn from people who are not Christians, there are some things they're going to teach us that's not good. I mean, we go to school, for example. Our teachers are not Christians. Sometimes they say things we shouldn't believe. But we go to school and we don't say, oh, I won't go to school unless my teacher is a Christian. You know, I won't listen to my boss's advice unless he's a Christian. Now, so number one, learn from the world, but learn to spit out things, all right? Worldliness is different. Worldliness is not learning from the world, but wanting to be like the world. Okay, so in chapter 11, we see the Israelites starting to complain about food. And one of the biggest problems throughout their journey was complaining. Now, the commonest sin, I think, among Christians, besides presumption, <clears throat> sins of omission, the commonest committed sin, commission, eh, sins of commission, is complaining. We complain so frequently and it's acceptable, acceptable among Christians. Quite sad that Christians are big complainers. So you'll find that often their problem in the wilderness was complaining. You see, complaining needs no character, needs no talent, needs no skill, needs no effort. It's so natural, all right? And so please be careful about complaining. And you find often that complaints are about food, not lack of food, but food that didn't suit their taste. Now that's so funny that it almost like food becomes like an idol. See, we eat to live. But most Christians live to eat. They find that eating is critical, very important to them. We should eat to live and not live to eat, but live to God. You know, you say, but then what about my satisfaction? I don't get satisfaction. I remember Jesus when he was sitting down, talking to the Samaritan lady. His disciples came back with food and said, Jesus, eat. This is John chapter 4. And Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. I have meat to eat that you know not of. They brought back food. Thinking Jesus is hungry and said, Whoa, food. Jesus said, I'm so satisfied. What did he do? He had just shared the truth with the Samaritan lady. You know, when you're full of joy, it's like someone in love, no need to eat so much. No good food also, okay. Right? Why? Because there is a satisfaction in us. Okay? So let's, you know, missionaries, often missionaries, the biggest problem is they cannot serve in certain countries because they can't eat the food there. They struggle to eat the food of that land. We've made 
our taste buds, our gods. Be careful about that. Okay, so don't make eating such a big deal. Eating can be pleasurable. It is a pleasure, but I tell you, when your heart is right with God, all kinds of food tastes good. Then in chapter 11, Moses is so tired of the complaining. He says, God, I can't take this anymore. Help me, God. And God said, appoint 70 elders and I'll put my spirit, your spirit upon them and they will help you carry burdens. Most times, Christian leaders burn out because they don't work with a team. They carry everything. They want to do everything and they burn out. If you have a team, you don't get burned out, you get encouraged, you get excited to work together. Okay, so though Moses and Aaron were the key people, yet they had a strong 70 elders helping them. Very nice. Then chapter 12, we see another problem. Miriam and Aaron envy Moses. How come every time Moses, Moses, God talks to Moses, he's a spokesman for God. Why not us? We see envy is a huge problem among Christian leaders. That's why Christian leaders often will never cooperate with one another. Especially the little churches who need help from the big churches, they don't want that help because they envy. How come that church is so successful and I am not successful, right? So they envy the other person. Be careful, Christian leaders. You see God blessing someone more, God using someone more. Don't be envious. It's not easy. Human nature, the pride of man. We see that repeated in chapter 16. Korah. Korah and 250 men came to Moses and said, We also are children of God. Why do you make yourself greater than us? Moses never made himself greater than them. It was God who called him. But yet, they felt that, why should God, Moses have the limelight? Why should Moses be the star? Why should Moses be our chief? And they rebelled, they, they, they protested against this. You know, for that, 14,700 Israelites died. For Miriam, she was made leprous for a while. It's like as if she had total leprosy. So again, two stories of envy here, both by leaders. Miriam and Aaron were the same family as Moses. They were siblings. Korah and his 250 were Levites, chosen by God, but not the stars. So please, all of us, don't be careful of the sin of envy. It always creeps up. Right? And learn to be thankful that someone is better than you. Esteem them better. Learn from them. Help them. Because at the end of it all, we are doing God's work. Don't build your little kingdom. Build God's kingdom. It's very. There are 40 over 1,000 Christian denominations, each one wanting to be stars in their own denomination. Most of these churches did not break away because of doctrinal issues. They broke away because of personalities who could not stand that they were number two, not number one. So they broke away and formed another church. Now in chapter 20, a very strange thing happened. They were short of water. You know, throughout the wilderness experience, it's marvelous. They had water all along. The Bible says, and they, the rock, Water came from a rock, and that rock is Christ. That's said in the New Testament. It's very interesting. I don't know exactly what it means. Commentators have different meanings. But the point is, they needed two to three million gallons of water every day. How did they get it? What about the cattle, the sheep? Some people ask, what did the cattle eat? Well, I guess they ate the manna too, <laughs> all right? What else was there to eat? There was no grass there, not for all their sheep, all right? So probably the... People pick up the manna, the, the, the unpicked up manna, the cattle ate it up and they were well. But they needed water. Manna provided their bread, not their water. And somehow God provided them water throughout. I don't know how. I'm not sure. Okay? 
But I know Jesus later said, He is the fountain of living water. You drink the water in the wilderness, you get thirsty. But you get from me, you have a spring in you, flowing out to life everlasting. That's in John, I think. All right, so the point is, in Genesis 20, there was no water. And God said to Moses, for some reason, there was no water at this time. God said to Moses, go and speak to the rock. You see, in Exodus chapter 17, verse 6, when they lacked water, God said to Moses, this is long earlier, much earlier, strike the rock, and water gushed out. But this time he said, speak to the rock. But Moses was so angry with the people who were complaining, complaining, he couldn't take it anymore. He took his rod and he whacked the rock twice. He struck it twice. And water came out. But you know what God said to Moses? You disobeyed me. You will not enter the promised land. Wow. He led them for 40 years in the wilderness to go into the promised land. But he never stepped in until years later on the Mount of Transfiguration, he came back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thousands of years later. But he never in his physical body entered the promised land. Why was God so angry with him for striking the rock twice? That's a huge punishment not to enter the promised land. I don't know. My thinking is he struck the rock once and the Bible says the rock is Christ in the New Testament. Christ was struck once. He suffered once for our sins. And then the second time when God instructed Moses, don't strike. Just speak to the rock. But he struck it again. I think it's a type of Christ. Christ suffered just once. I don't know. Commentators don't say so. That's my speculation. But God seemed very, very strict. I guess God is always more strict with his leaders. If we as leaders don't obey God, how do you expect others to? We have to be role models. We, have to, we are kept expected a higher standard as leaders. 21, very interesting story. They complain about their food, a sick and tired of manna, and they complain about their food. So God is so tired with them, God so angry with them about their complaining. Be careful of complaining, huh? He sent fiery serpents, poisonous vipers, and bit them. And then they pleaded to Moses, 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 please pray to God, ask God to remove these serpents, they're killing us, they're killing our children. And you know what God said to Moses? Make a brass serpent, nail it to a pole, and lift it up among the people. What? What kind of, like, what kind of cure is this? They're biting us, they're killing us. Can't you just say, you, Lord, you just say, serpents die, they all die. But did he do that? didn't say that. God said, build another serpent, lift it up. And whoever is bitten has only one chance to survive. He has to immediately look up, wherever he is in the camp, he has to look up at that pole, and at the top of the pole was the serpent. Bro brazen, bronze serpent. Wow! What in the world is this? You won't know what it's all about until John Chapter 3. Remember John chapter 3 is our famous chapter on John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3.16. But have you ever read John 3.14? Two verses before that. John 3.14 says, And as Moses was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now you realize what that serpent was. It was a type of Christ. The Israelites in the wilderness were bitten by poisonous snakes. They had poison in them that would kill them 
in seconds. Once the poison reached their heart, heart stops, they're dead. But if they immediately looked at the brass serpent lifted up, they would live. What's that got to do with us? We also have a poison. The poison is not from vipers, it's from sin. We have a poison in us that guarantee will kill us. Except unless we look up at the cross and say, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose again on the third day for me. Well, when you say that, you live forever. So I, now when you see John 3.16 and then you go back to John 3.14, then you link it up to Numbers 21. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man, Jesus, be lifted up on the cross. Interesting, huh? Okay, so many people don't know John 3.16, never knew how it links up to Numbers. But Numbers story in chapter 21 is a type of Christ on the cross, the serpent. Have you ever noticed that all, almost all medical associations have a serpent on a rod? <laughs> Singapore Medical Association has that. Okay, that is the serpent that healed the people of poison. It's like a symbol of doctors today. Chapter 22, a very interesting story, a guy called Balaam. Who is this guy, Balaam? You know, he was called by the king to put a curse on the Israelites. The Israelites were coming through his land and they, they were all afraid of the Israelites. They were like, so two, two, three million. No, no tribe was that big then. And they were coming and he, he was afraid of them, this king called Balak. And he called for Balaam. Who is Balaam? Balaam obviously was famous as a kind of sorcerer who could put a curse on people. So in those days, when kings went to war, before they went to war, one of the things they did was to get a sorcerer to curse the enemy. Now Balaam, it appears to me anyway, that he had a direct communication with God Almighty, with Jehovah God. I think he was truly a prophet of God who knew God, but he was a prophet who loved money. And so when Balak offered him money to curse the Israelites, he took that, even though God said, don't curse them. Later, he said, he bargained with God and God said, okay, go ahead and do it. Balaam is a type, I believe, of many men of God, good men of God, once upon a time, who, because of the love of money, will do things that are against God for the love of money. So this is a long, many, many chapters on Balaam. I was wondering why, why this silly story is so, so long. Who the world is this guy anyway? He's mentioned several times in the New Testament, but I believe today. It's God telling us there are Balaams today, many Balaams, who once knew God, who were children of God, and yet who love money. But one thing Balaam said when he was asked to curse God, he did, he, he, his mouth couldn't do it because God was controlling him. In Numbers 24, and I think verse 51, He's predicted a star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Balaam made a prophecy about a star coming out of Jacob and a scepter coming out of Israel. And I think when the wise men saw the star, they may have linked it to Balaam's prophecy about the star. Okay, so I don't know. Possibly. Mm. Then lastly, we see in chapter 25, a guy called Zimri. He's mentioned by name, the woman he fornicated, the Midianite woman, the Canaanitish woman he fornicated with near the temple, in front of the tabernacle. How 
both of them are named clearly how God asked the people of Israel to thrust him through with a spear and the woman too. Wow, sounds fierce. Why? Why is this mentioned? At 25, it's just before they were, chapter 25, just before they entered the promised land. And you know the promised land was full of fertility religions where prostitutes were in the temple. Zimri had the nerve to bring this Canaanite woman and have sex in front of the tabernacle. It was thrust through with a spear. God was warning them, my tabernacle will be different. Once they entered into Can Canaan, the promised land, they would see temple prostitutes everywhere, fertility cults, sex makes the land fertile. Wow! Phallic symbols everywhere. They were called Asheroth poles. Right? So, that comes to the, some of the lessons we can learn from Numbers. Then from Numbers 26 onward, actually, continues straight on to Deuteronomy. They were just at the border of the promised land and rules are given to them. Rules are given to them. And it continues. Rules continue to be given, 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 given right through Deuteronomy. Preparing them, reminding them for what they must do when they enter the promised land. Okay, so the book of Numbers is very messy. Exodus is very simple. The first half, journey. Second half, rules and regulations, laws. Numbers, all mixed up. Travel here and then rules, then travel here and then rules. That's why when people read numbers, they get kind of confused. They can't remember what they read. Right? So that's one of the problems when people read numbers. But I hope today, after the study on numbers, you see the big picture and the beautiful picture. Why they live there? What were they learning? How's that got to do with us? What is the character of God? You see a God that is careful. It's a God that doesn't like us to be just irreverent. Who is this God? How to come to this God? Wow, so many sacrifices. You need Christ. And then even if you had Christ, you need to be clean. And then you need to be careful to approach this God we worship. God bless you.